What's going on, good people? It's Khalil Gibran, one time for your mind, two time for your spine. We got a very, very, very special guest in the building. My brother that I met out in France, Papillon the Butterfly, the Peanut Butterfly, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm -hmm. Phenomenal artist. Um, and the crazy part, what I like most about Papillon is that we haven't really worked extensively yet, but I already know, and, and I'm so excited about the possibilities of what I know is going to be. And it's very rare these days that just the thought of working with an artist kind of gets you kind of going. And right now, and sorry to take this so long on in the intro, but I just, I just wanted people to understand where we're coming from. Um, I appreciate that. It's because Papillon has sent me some beats, and I'm just, I'm just living with them, and I just know, I just can't even put it in words. But Papillon, but Peter Butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Cheers to you. What's going on, my brother? Cheers, cheers, cheers. I'm all right. I'm all right. A lot is going today? on. I'm, I'm feeling actually I want to be truthful um Please do. from the get. Um I'm relieved to be sitting down right here. Actually, I just got back from the Caribbean where I visited family and uh, you know, uh you know I got some history um that I had to deal with. And so uh, I brought back a little bit of, of rum from Martinique and I just helped myself to a glass of rum to end a very uh exhausting day and i gotta say exhausting a few a uh, month mm. so so it's good to be with you sitting down and uh and checking your vibes man like i told you before we're on the air i love i love the hair i'm so happy to see you feeling free and <laughs> i can i know it nice. feels good oh man <laughs> people have been asking you, like, oh, you want to do your hair oh man no nah, man enjoy <laughs> yes yes See, I oh. cut all my stuff off, man. I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm changing the vibes up a little bit for myself. So I'm good, man. Thank you for asking. It's good to do that every once in a while, right? But I, I wanna, um, wanna ask you about uh, your career as an artist, um, your life as, you know, a person of color growing up, or just not growing up, living in France, uh, mm. being in different countries. And I just want to expose my people to um, someone as eclectic and well cultured as you. And I want them to see the ingredients that goes into that. So Man, the, I guess yeah. I want to act. You got something you want to say? No, I'm just saying the ingredients are... are a lot of them are accidental, and uh, but they all change the flavor. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful thing. So, how, take us into your journey and your beginnings as an artist. Oh well, it's it's really um, a beginning as an artist and not just an observer. Was pretty young still. As a kid, I was, I come from a family, I grew up in Paris, France. My mother's American, quite white, American, wasp, um, but um, rejected from her family because she had babies with my father, who was a black West Indian man from the French Caribbean island of Martinique. So now I, I come, I, I come up in a, in Paris, um, Son of two people that came from abroad, one from the U.S. and the other from from the Caribbean, and they met in Paris. And so, mm -hmm. so I'm I'm born in the mid '70s, so they're they're having a great time because the '70s sounds like it was pretty fun uh, in in Paris at the time. And, and so by the time by by the time I, I I'm 12 years old, my father had been a dancer. Uh, entertainer. He was in the cabaret doing shows, um, limbo dancing, doing all sorts of traditional dancing, and and just mixing with the the, 
the nightlife in Paris, and uh, and uh, but I didn't live with me by the time I, I I grew up, and I'm 12 years old, and I get an opportunity to make a movie. Um, a casting director comes to my school and was looking for a kid that spoke English because we're in Paris and they want a black kid and I'm, you can see I'm not that dark skinned so the audition was particularly like, you're not black, I'm like, sorry, <laughs> you know, but we did the audition and and it turns out the actor that plays the father of my character was light skinned and whatever, so it fit. And okay. so basically I, I, uh, I started um, a career as an actor, and as my father, I grew up like in the nightclub. My dad worked and lived and worked in and, and uh, managed. Um, so, so I was all about you know the show and stuff. And I wanted to do music maybe one day. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I wanted to be in the show. And so, being an actor was kind of exciting to me. I got to be a. My first job was was actually a supporting role, so it was a big deal, and there was a supporting role to it. To the equivalent of the French equivalent of Elvis, that got Johnny Holiday. So it was like a big deal. It was like you're gonna do that. I'm like, I don't know. I don't like his music, but you know he's famous, and that makes me, you know, part of a big project. So so that's how I jumped in to the deep end as far as France goes. It was like, you know, that guy was a a, a big fish in a small pond, right? So he's a big big deal, and so I get all that attention. I get to experience what it's like to be in a team working on on on, on projects storytelling you know movies like but there's like 40 50 people working on this thing it's not just just an idea you're having it's like wow this is an industry i'm in the in, in the industry suddenly so i finished that job excited i was already getting interested in, in music and so my salary i got which i got ripped off now that i you know after the fact i found out as soon as i get got an agent i found out they underpaid me but that's a lot of the money for me you know, we lived in a very small apartment in the in kind of the, right. the hood hood of, of in Paris, in the north of Paris, which was at the time just working class and, and just immigrants and and stuff. So, so so we you know to me that was big money. You know, single mom and all that shit. And I'm bringing in some money for my mom. I was like excited about it, and uh, and so I bought my first instruments. So that's how I just got into saying, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna start financing my own life. Um, being French American in Paris, my mother wanted us to stay bilingual because she knew the importance. Like you spoke about multicultural, she knew that would carry me. She didn't want me to lose the opportunity. Yes. You know, so so in France, um, she looked for private schools because you don't get bilingual schools in the public, like in America. Actually, you know, you barely teach you Spanish in America, public schools. So it was like. You know, she she needed us to study in English. So private schools means money. And at age twelve, you're coming into the I guess the sixth grade or seventh grade. You know, it's it's a budget for a parent to pay for private school. I have a big sister who's already being put through school. So so my money from my my job was put towards my education. So I, I was empowered by that. I really felt like I had a little bit of an attitude also. Always my teachers when they told me I wasn't trying hard enough at school. I'm like, if I wasn't trying, you wouldn't get paid. I was like, you know, my, my, I'm paying. The, the salary. You know, I had a little bit of, a, you know, by the time I was 16 years old, like I was fighting with my teachers. I was like, man, if I don't, if I'm not getting good grades, it's not teaching me right. I was like, mad, mad about it because I was from age 12 when I got that first job. I just kept working. I, 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 a casting director called me, got me another job, and then introduced me to an agent. I got an agent. I started being an actor. I was like, I wanted to be taken seriously because during the week you're on the set, right. you're a kid, but they're giving you money and they're expecting you to work. So they're talking to you like a grown up. And then you go back right. to school and people talk to you like, like you're a child. And I didn't like that. So, so I was very fortunate to, um, to fall into like business young. It, it took away some of the playtime that kids have, but, but it was good. It was good because I got I got respect and responsibility really early in life, and so most of my money then, I was making I was buying guitar, and synthesizers because we're talking like this is eighty nine nineties you know it was like synthesizers was a thing you know and drum machines and stuff so I started buying stuff and my room turned into like little home studio shit, so um, I was making noise in my room, 
And over time, I, I, I just kept accumulating tools to make my music. I, I ended up, uh, uh, I was passionate about Miles Davis um, uh, and uh, Jimi Hendrix. And uh, I guess those were my early influences. And so so uh, I started playing trumpet and got this trumpet player that can let me right. a trumpet for a while. And I tried out, like, I could do this. So I bought a trumpet and I, so that's what I was doing. I was just from that moment on. So by the time I'm 14, 15, I was, I was, um, I was making music in my room. It went from like weird ambient dub stuff. Cause you know, drum machines, you just get into a loop and just it's hypnotic, you know, there's a trance kind of thing going on, whatever the rhythm you're creating, right. because you're a kid all by yourself, it's just a, a, a loop and you keep going on that. So kept it going and then I play a little guitar on it and, and then I make another loop and, it was all about loops and I had this little turntable, but it wasn't like like the techniques, like you couldn't pull it back. It was like it had the, the rubber band that that would drive it. So I had to take the rubber band off and so so I could pull it back. But then it wouldn't be drawn forward. So I had to do both ways. So it was kind of like playing with that. I had audio tapes, cassette tapes at the time. I would open them up and make a loop and scotch tape them shut so that you can make a loop so you gotta no, that time I was really like, you know, trying to find a way to make some music before I had the skills to 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 per play an instrument. And once that, while that's going on, I am learning my scales, right. you know, and I'm learning stuff. So eventually, my 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 game started being more interesting on the instrument, on the guitar, first of all. Yeah, so that's kind of how it pulls all together. As in the early days, that's what it is. Music is something that that I do as soon as I get home from school. We're talking 90, yeah, like early 90s. So I'm influenced by, by uh, vinyls my dad had from his, his club. He had a he, he, he had vinyl a lot, so I would go borrow his vinyl. So one of my first records was Get on the Good Foot, the James Brown cut. And from the B-side, mm. there's a 45 on the B-side. Okay. had the, the next piece. It was like Get on the Good Foot, and then you flip it over. And, and this, this, the next piece of the song, it was that. And then there was Sesame Street records. Uh. So I was like taking Big Bird and like, you know, A, B, 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 and doing all that, you know, doing my scratching on ABCs and shit on Sesame Street and Roosevelt Franklin. I don't know if you're even familiar with that, that character. That was my favorite Sesame Street character who's like the African-American uh, purple Muppet. And he was like, it's so mm -hmm. funky. I was like, man. So, so that's what I was doing, you know, listening to that. Or, or even another one was Easy Reader from the Electric Company, which is also one of those kids programs that had the vinyl for that. And that was, um, that's actually Morgan Freeman. When he was young. He's doing these like kind of raps and stuff. So I was into, into taking that and it's what I had. So I just cut it up, making stuff out of it. That and my mom's like, had some Brazilian records like Tokino and and Josh Ben and, and so it was like a big mix of whatever I could find I would take the vinyls and and I copy it onto a tape and then it had a double tape deck so I could copy the same loop again and again on the next tape so I'd make these loops and over overlay stuff which after a while mm -hmm. makes it sound terrible because by the time you're at the seventh layer the first layer is kind of like dim you can't really hear it no Figure more it so out. then you get yeah. into it yeah, but in the same, but once you realize that, you start creating a technique. Say, okay, so what I want in the background to record that first, and then mm -hmm. and, and what's in the foreground has got to be the last layer. So you, mm -hmm. it's basically you're building your song backwards, with you know the layers in the back, and then the beat has to be more more strong. So you you record that last, and it's there. It sounded terrible. I got some yeah. tapes. I found some tapes recently. It sounds terrible, but the process is something that now when I produce music. I still like I'm able to tell you the story now because because it, it's uh it's, it, it put an imprint it's just practice hours and hours of doing some random shit it's not random after a while you know it becomes right. foundation and then you can build yeah. you know and detach from that and try to be professional because eventually it became my job mm -hmm. so so how was the scene in Paris when you started the transition from being an actor to playing your trumpet to producing these loops? Uh, were you moving around, were you performing? I was, um, so the acting was the job. That was the money. That was also part of the fun. 
keeping me. I mean, I, I get to miss school and shit. But it's always good. Right. <laughs> um. But uh, but I, I finished my schooling. I was really trying to be serious about that to honor my mother, and also just because I didn't know what future held. But um, as far as performing music, I um, my loops and stuff was what I would do, and then I invite you know you get a homie from school comes over, and so I did some stuff with some some friends. We had some Dixie jazz music we looped, and then I, he wrote. He was this brother from Ghana who was in school with me, and, and he would write rhymes. And we were into the tribe called Quest a lot, and De La Soul. That was a big big influence on us. And or like Dana Dane and Slick Rake and that type of like storytelling. So we would do a lot of storytelling. And at the same time, I was into dance hall music, like Yellow Man and Ika Mouse, Michigan and Smiley. That's a whole generation of the dance hall thing in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So we would have this kind of hybrid sound. I did a little a, a songs with him in, in the apartment. That's what we would do. And then my trumpet, um, I would play just for me. I just you know worked my trumpet in my corner, had a little bit of a, uh, uh, a project with a brother from St. Lucia, actually a, a grown man. He was like 35 years old when I was like 16. But I was, I was, I had enough money to travel. I had a, a, an agent in Paris, but also had a manager in, in London because um, mm. that I'd met through, through work and I, and I decided maybe I could give it a try in London. So I go to London sometimes to try to do auditions for movies. Um, so when I went there, I go see this brother from St. Lucia who was a grown jazz player, bass player. His name was A Bass, Adrian Bass. And he was an amazing musician. And he played, he was one of those guys that played eight hours an instrument, eight, ten hours a day. And uh, it was a great, you know, role model for me. So I go to his place. I don't know how my mom would let me do this, just leave. I was like, I'm going to London. It wasn't a day. There was no cell phones and all that. So like when you're leaving mom, mom's like, okay, good luck. You know, you're taking the train to a boat across, right. you know, the English Channel and you take another train and you get to London and I go to his right. apartment back in the days, but like to pay the gas, for the gas to keep running in the house, you had to put like tokens and shit. It was a whole nother reality. England was a trip to me. And so I go there and he had gigs in London. So he would be like, we have, a, we have three concerts this weekend. I'm like, okay. And so he, he had his brother on the percussion. He was on the bass, and, and so they do anyway. And and I was supposed to hold down the trumpet piece. And I was like, well, I don't know the songs or nothing, right? Because we weren't sending MP3s at the time. We were just like, just come over and we'll work it out. So I get, I would get to London. We eat, you know, some pasta or tuna or something. We just and and he played me the songs, and I had to learn them for tonight. You know that type of shit. So that was cool because he put some pressure on the on the on the the job part of it, because it's easy to make music at home. But when you're gonna go to a club, and you're, I was underage, and London's cool with that though. They weren't too asking me for, they were carding kids and shit, but I was definitely underage getting into these jazz clubs at night and performing under pressure, because I was not, I mean, I was not the best trumpet player. I have a lot of soul and I could, I could pull it off like that. But I didn't have the, the, the theory and the, the skills that, that um, I felt it were required. So I was really intimidated, but that was a beautiful piece of my story for me. Um, so that lasted a little while. Um, the acting got me into the habit of doing auditions and I had done an audition for music, a music project. And uh, so I ended up recording an album when I was, I think 15. It was like a kid's band. It was a fully, you know, um, artificial project. It's like a record label. It was phonogram at the time. It just became, no, it's polygram. Anyway, the labels that don't exist, but they were sub labels that were bought out by eventually by Universal Records and all that shit. And so it was a, the days of just like making quick money, you know, off a record. And so they needed five kids that could sing or rap. And so I, they took me to represent France. They had like these five kids from around Europe. And the themes were supposed to be ecological, which was a new thing at the time. No one was talking about. And it was no Greta Thunberg or whatever. It was like it was like there was no conscience about ecology at the time. But somehow somebody came up with the concept. Let's get these five kids from five different countries in Europe talking about the planet. And so I end up in this huge project that was sponsored by one of the partners was a manufacturing company in Hong Kong, some Israeli dudes that had a business in Hong Kong making toys and, and, and bags and like fashion wear and stuff. And so it was basically a scam to just make a bunch of money. 
But for me, what it was was an opportunity to get into the, the <coughs> biggest studios in Paris with mm. you know producers that had just made the biggest hits, and they were like, "Make us a hit!" And so they made us an album, and so we did a whole a full album. Terrible music. I hated the music, but I didn't care. I had the best you know quality equipment around me. I had like. We were sleeping in the hotels, doing the whole thing. We we're doing little mini tours, mm -hmm. doing TV shows in Luxembourg or Germany, and 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 kids are signing autographs. Kids didn't actually know, they didn't know us, but we right, got. To, right, it was right. almost like we faking it, like doing a pretend uh, superstar career for a second. And so right. I got to, to to see all the ropes of how the business works at the time, because business has changed since then. But I was like, oh, I got this. And then the album never came out. Well, the, the single came out, and then the album didn't come out because the producer ran out with the money. It was like one of those messed up, you know, purely business deals, you know? But Yo. when that shit happened, he still owed me money. He still owed all the kids money for our work wow. in the studio and all that. But I didn't care because I was so happy that that record never came out because the music was terrible. I hated it. Mm -hmm. But I got to be in the studio. I got to do, because it was recorded in Paris. All the other kids would go back mm -hmm. to Berlin or London or whatever, but I lived in Paris. So when it wasn't a vo voice recording time, when it had all the team together, I would still sneak into the studio and hang out and see. So so that taught me a lot about like, man, what's what's a compressor? What's a, like, you know, mm -hmm. what's this, a sound booth? got to have was was the process of making music and so i gotta say man my whole childhood was about learning how to make how show business worked how to avoid pedophiles how to how to fucking cope with insanity how to right. say no thank you to cocaine how to fucking mm -hmm. you know but how to make a record you know Right. How to make a music video, like what does wardrobe mean? Go, you know, how do you organize a photo shoot? So, so I got a lot of, I got, I got a lot of experience that way, and that was that was a blessing for me. Meanwhile, I was making my beats and my little things and making my music, but it wasn't going to go anywhere because I had no, unless I followed their agenda, I wasn't going to release, and make money off my records. I was just making mm -hmm. little songs for me, and and now I'm happy when I find an old recording of it, but. But I did get a lot from understanding how how fucked up the industry was. That's kind of the best thing I, I learned is what to avoid, you know, and how to save your soul at the right moment, but still, like, make them think you're down for a second just long right. enough to get your <laughs> word across. You know? Man, right. it's crazy because we're artists, but but and, and, and we, we got predators around us. I was a child, man. I, I literal like predators, you know, around. Mm. And so, so you need to learn to navigate that. Um, and I feel very fortunate. I've heard some terrible child star stories, man. That people got fucked up on it, whether it's drugs or just, you know, abuse or whatever. I was so fortunate and and, and clever. I just um, I just see shit. I was paying attention. I was a child. You know, twelve year olds, thirteen year olds. They're, they're smart. They see shit. Right. And so that's what, that was me, and I got to see like all the grown-ups acting crazy as of certain hour because they've been doing cocaine and drinking, and you know I know not to deal, not to hang out after a certain hour. If you go to the release party, you go just to show and do the pictures, but you leave early, even if the party looks fun. That shit, right. you know, I learned that. So I, I feel like I really got the good side and, and didn't suffer too much of the consequences of being around, uh, you know narcissistic people crazy right. people. <laughs> so around what what age were you when you started to like spin off and kind of do your own sort of thing so i, I thought i was going to be able to make an album by the end of high school but i had to find people to make it with and my classmates were still children to me mm. and um a couple of guys I remember had talent, would it could have pulled something off, but they they weren't in the psycho psychologically ready, you know. But artistically, they were. But when I um I started committing to to my music, it was um it was with a funk man. I don't know if it's funk. His brother from Cam Cameroon, and he's still around. He's still making music too. 
um, this brother Sango. He was a he was a young man, and I was I was younger, <laughs> but I had that energy. And he was like, "Yo, you speak English? You sing in English? Let's do this stuff." And he was a bass player, and I would play guitar and sing. So we started writing songs, and uh, wrote some nice songs. He had some good songs too. I think he still plays some of them actually. We fell out because he took advantage of the fact that I was a kid and I wrote some of these lyrics. He ran off with, with the projects, tried to sell him. It didn't work for him. So then he felt bad, but it's too late. So quickly I moved from there to this other brother, but I always had needed a partner. There's something about that I have to work on still. I needed a partner to work with. So I ended up with this other brother from Senegal in the hip hop kind of uh, vibe. He was like a, his aspiration was to be like, like the African Busta Rhymes, you know. This is right around right a bit before like Wuha and all that shit when Busta was like heavy hitting and maybe the first outcast like uh, me and you, yo mama and your cousin too. You know that? You remember that elevators? It was that era kind of, and so and we had our own twist on on hip hop because he's from Senegal and I'm writing in English, but we're putting a Wolof in there, so it's got this African flow in there. So it's, it's got this um, American, you know, hip hop, you know, culture foundation. But I was writing all the lyrics for me and for him. Mm. And then I was trying to throw in, I didn't speak Wolof, but I was learning it. And I was trying to throw in, I was having him, I was saying, man, you should be rapping in Wolof because when he speaks, he was so, so uh, flamboyant and shit. I was like, that language is so musical. I don't know if you're familiar with Senegal and its music, but. Wolof has got a, a, a swing to it. So I was like, let's fit that in. So I was starting to do this this mix because I was already American and French speaking. So I was like doing this Franklish kind of mixing languages. And so I was like, let's pull this African vibe in. So my name at the time, that's actually when I got, first got the name Papillon, uh, the peanut butterfly. But, bef but, but while I'm doing that, you know, you're always changing names. Yeah, everybody had all these different names. And, and so I had my Senegalese name. I was Niem Chona and Borom Chona with the trouble solver, the problem solver. And I had all these, mm. so I was like, yeah, let's do this and that. So we had this thing called the Baifal Association. Baifal is, um, is a war, kind of the, the soldiers of uh, the Murid. The Murid is a, is a Muslim uh, brotherhood. So I started getting into this thing. And to me, it was important. The spirituality was really important in it. I wasn't committed to to, to any particular religion, but, but spirituality, I've always, felt it, it is a big, big piece of, of what I need to do. I can't move forward without without the spirit. So so I was like borrowing his attitude and his his culture. So, you know, while we were, I'd go to his house and record and write and write for hours and he'd do his prayers and come back and then we'd eat and then we'd record some more, smoke a lot of weed. And he's super charismatic. I was like, yeah. But then that kind of crashed too because his ego was so huge and I was too too young and humble to to, to challenge him. Right. So uh, from there, uh, I, I eventually stood up for myself. Said, "Man, I'm writing all these lyrics." We, get, we went to studio. We made a full album in studio that was never released. He found a, 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 a producer, this white dude that was like old oh, man, full of money. That was in the music industry since the '70s. That released like the Village People. Remember that band, like a village disco band some French dude produced right. that. And so we meet this guy and he's like, yeah, I got money. Uh, I'll get you, I'll produce this record. So we got studio time and we started doing all this stuff, but then it wasn't going and he, he never did anything with it. So by the end of that, I've met this other guy, this DJ called DJ Wamba. DJ Wamba started coming up and making beats with us. And, and, uh, and Wamba's like, yo man, you gotta get out of here. I, I was married, I was a young, I was married at the time to a, to a young uh, painter. From, from Los Angeles, and I was already in my thing, you know, in the, the, that's when I got into the graffiti life, you know, hanging out with, like, brothers from the Bronx, and, and, uh, anyway, brothers from, from the U.S. That, that had made it in France and Italy, so I already had my scene, but I didn't have my own project off the ground, and this brother said, the Wamba said, yo, you gotta meet this guy, John Bonsai, I make music with, so I'm like, all right, so I'll meet this Bonsai guy. John Banzai is this Polish uh, dude, but speaks French. And uh, he grew up in Paris, and he's rapping. He started writing. He's a writer, but he he, he uh, started writing in French. And he wasn't a hip hop head yet, but he was getting into it. So then, Wamba was making beats, and he was 
kind of teaching the whole culture to this guy, uh, John Bonsai. And I was like, this guy's got skills. He can write for real. And Wamba was like, that's why I want you to know him and, and you guys should meet. So we, we, we started uh, messing around, you know, just for the, the, the record. You know, the B-side has the instrumentals at the time on the vinyl, just to start writing and rapping. And we, the three of us, so DJ Wamba, John Bonsai, and I started this band called Visionaires. And so that was our first, that was the first time I finished a product. Um, we made a, a mixtape called Blink at the time. And we put it up online recently just because we're like, ah, oh, we got to release it now because we did a tape, literal tape and at the time and CD. Um, and we pushed it to the, you know, magazines and radio stations and started getting some attention because we we're doing this bilingual thing. He was rapping in French and I was rapping in English. And uh, and it came together really nice, man. It was really fun for me. It was, you know, he's my brother. Every day I go to this house and whistle. And we'd open the door. I go upstairs. We'd be writing for hours, then go record. And and, and, uh, and yeah, we had some good jams. And uh, and that was the first one we we brought to the record labels because then some people that knew us was like, yo, you gotta come meet my friend. He works at Virgin. We went to Virgin for a meeting. They listened to it. They were out. Oh wow, this is all right. We'll call you back. We go to Sony at the time, mm. V2. Anyway, there's all these little sub labels too. And we're going to all the Sony record labels. Yeah, in Paris at the time. Okay. And so there was them. And uh, meanwhile, I'd done another product with BMG, which was another one of the, the big labels at the time. And so I was starting to know people. And people that knew me were like, oh, he's doing stuff. Mm. But it's kind of weird. It's in English. What is it? What is he doing? Where is he from? So. It didn't pick up on those, but when we got to Sony and to Virgin, they were starting to both talk about which one of us. You know how record labels kind of work, synchronized, you know. Um, these are major labels, so they got their budgets and they got their, their agenda and their calendars. So they was like, okay, we might take this. Um, we need you to adjust a few things. Next year, we're gonna, we need a new project. We need like this kind of like hip-hop because we were doing hip-hop but kind of like really good spirited we weren't angry hip-hop we weren't we were lyricists and we were we were kind of fun we were just silly sometimes so they were into that they were like okay um we need kind of like you know something that can go mainstream but still represent hip-hop because we need credibility but at the time france had had got as going through some culture you know complex where where the the minister of culture made it created a law and they voted something into law which was that you had the radio stations had to play 50 percent french language music because france was losing its identity because there's so much international music coming to england and the u.s right so to defend you know basically to sell records to defend french culture they were like we need more of our music played on the radio so they said to us, this is great. We love your energy. We will put whatever the, the budget was onto this and three album contract. And this is a time where people were writing contracts that they were ridiculous. They had contracts. You were like in there for three, to five albums sometimes. And they would give you the advance, but then you owe them money. You know, the whole, you know, you never owned the masters. It was not okay. So I wasn't loving that, but at the same time, it was tempting, right? But the one thing that, that turned me off is that they said, yo, except we need you to rap in French. And I was like, I mean, I speak French fluently. I love French, but hip hop didn't work for me in French. It's a metric. You got to understand English has a flow. Creole works. Wolof works. And like, there's all these languages that work. Lingala from, uh, works. There's, uh, Swahili works. There's a lot of languages that work on the 4-4 beat, on that beat. Mm-hmm. But French to me didn't work, and there's a lot of French artists that were okay, but they just wasn't working for me. So I was like, yeah, I could do a waltz of French music because French has commas and long, three syllable, five syllable words. You know, it was too much to fit on the beat. I didn't find it groovy. So I was like, and why should I change to sing in French just because you guys want airplay? Because the idea is that if we don't have French music, we won't get airplay because the radio was already full of like whatever it was, Michael Jackson, Elton John, you know, American hip hop, uh, you know, 
all that stuff. So they needed something to be, you know, in French. Cause, and it was messed up. It didn't ever work. That law didn't work. Because what ended up happening is that they would play the French music like at 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. when no one was listening. All day it was still that American stuff, right? So it was. It made no sense. But for me, I was like, I told my boy, I was like, man, I can't do this. Because that means that my verses, I got to fill them out. And I'm just, they said you could do the hooks in English, but you got to speak French on the verses. And that, that was about my integrity. I'd been doing music long enough for myself without any attention that I wasn't willing or ready to give it up. I was ready to make movies and, and play someone else's script. But as far as my music was concerned, I, I was going to do what I want. So, so uh, I, the the band, I destroyed the band, man. It's fucked up. I feel bad to this day. I was like, guys, I can't do this. Like, yo, we almost signed to this label. We would have been on tour. And they were so mad at me. And uh, I said, I can't do it. So, so broke up the band. And after that, I, I um, kind of lost it for a minute, but I ended up making a solo album eventually um, because I met a studio that let me do what I wanted. And said they was so. so how how old were you during during that whole period of time when they wanted? That's to from my age seventeen. I started really writing rap, like and rapping, and I was yeah, like sixteen, seventeen. Before, like I said, I was doing like kind of funk, writing songs, doing a lot of soul kind of vibes, and jazz. But by the time I'm committing to like a, a a pen and a pad, I'm like roller skating in Paris and 16 years old, right? Like stopping at every corner, writing down my rhymes, keep going, just doing my right. thing. And so that was my rap years started. Yeah, 16. And it wasn't, it wasn't nothing deep at the beginning. It was just wordplay and phonetics. And then by, but by the time I was 18, I, I was serious. And my message was really serious to me. Um, actually, some of the shit I wrote then is smarter than the shit I write now, honestly. Because you it's know, like when the young blood, the young bloods, we got like you, you, you convinced. Yeah, yeah. You, know? you, you engulfed in the belief, and then and right, you know, and yeah. so happens the beliefs. Were, I still agree with some of them. So I'm like, ah, that's all right, man. But uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, by the time I got to my solo album, I was, I was, I was a young man, and uh, I'm, I was, I was able to be proud of what I did, you know, and because I had that. I'd, I'd won a battle which was to not give in, first of all, to the film industry because um, I was typecast. I eventually gave up acting because of being typecast. I couldn't take it anymore. Because I was getting good jobs. I was getting jobs where they weren't good. They were making, I was playing criminals and shit. because I'm non white, basically. France was not ready for the main character to not be white. And so, so I was getting all this weird character. Then I got mad one day and I said, Come my agent. I said, Stop. I'm not working anymore. Um, and in the music is the same thing, you know, I, I met, like I said, I did that record when I was 15. It was ridiculous. I did another project. I was like a boys band thing. They wanted me to sing and dance. Like, I was like, I can't do that stuff. It's ridiculous. Uh, and so I, I quit that. And then, and then I did my other rec you know, my records that actually believed in with my boy and then they tried to, to change it on us. So by, by the end of that, I was done. So I started making my own music and, and, um, I fell out with the, 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 the studio I recorded in, so so we never released it in big scale. So I had that frustration for a long time, feeling like, damn, I could have made it, right. but the trade off was was so not okay. So I've had a good life, man. I had a good life since then because I was since then I've been just myself. Um, but some of my people that knew me before. Say, man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you never made it. I'm like, shit, man. Mm -hmm. I just survived. I would have been dead by now if I followed the, the plan that, that, the, that the record labels had for me. It was not okay, man. They had all the gifts for me. They had all the sex and drugs and rock and roll ready waiting for me, man. But I was like, ah, it's going to kill me. It's going to kill right. me. So just my heart. And break my heart first, and then I'll just start sure, acting stupid. So I'm, I feel very fortunate, actually. So I, I do want to ask you. You mentioned before that you were married at a young age. Yeah. So like, how was, was that, man? man? What, 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 what in your mind, or what was going on at the time that made you say? <laughs> 
I want to commit myself to someone else in this way. I was a good person. <laughs> she was a healthy, she was a smart, great artist. Um, she was a painter. Um, we were we, at this point, you know, in retrospect, I I, I feel fortunate that we, we grew up together. We didn't grow up together, but as of age 17, we met. She was in art school in Paris, an American woman. And, uh, and I know we just fell in love and, and, uh, and we were very charismatic young people and everybody loved us. And we kind of got caught up in the, in, the role, in, the, in the thing, you know, where I was like, oh my God, look at these beautiful young people and they, they're just so talented and all that. So I got into that. And we started believing in ourselves a lot, which was good. But then we started believing in our couple, which which didn't end up working long term. But uh, but it, it was a great experience. And, and I say we grew up together because those years were important years. It's important when, you know, you're 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, you're becoming an adult. Like, ain't nobody going to, I mean, your parents got you if something bad really happens, if you're lucky. But, but it's that age where it's like, we talk to your parents once every four months or whatever. It's like, right. so you got to hold it down. And so she was very responsible. So was I. We were making money. At least I was making pretty decent money. She was making good art. She she's a, a, fanta a fantastic painter um, from Hollywood. She, um, you know, we we, uh, we had we lived in France together. Then went in and out of London, and then went to Los Angeles and Hawaii for a while. It was just a cool life, man. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to marry you, of course, man. Everybody thinks we're amazing. We got married in L.A. And then um, wow. and then life changed. Yeah, it was one of those funny weddings, you know, in a little chapel indoors. Like this little dude looked like Yoda. They married us real quick. <laughs> it was like almost a Vegas wedding. But we were into it. It was for real. Like we were actually, you know, that's what, was the, what we wanted to do. But I got in trouble with my family afterwards because because my family was not with us, and we just kind of just did it real quick. Um, right. But that was interesting. To but we were it's kind of role play, man. I, like I said, I started being um, having adult responsibilities from age twelve. Um, for most things, you know, I moved out of my mom's house pretty early and stuff. So, so I felt like it was time. I could, I was I knew how to handle myself, and I could be a man. So. So we did, I did that, but then you know life made it that we didn't you know it didn't work out for us. Um, I was a young young. I also was not always loyal. It was just silly. I was it was not it was, didn't work out. Um, but I but uh, I committed to that person for a while. She she left me, and I was like hmm. A couple of years of pain, and I was over it eventually because I was like yeah whatever. I, you know wonderful person and to this day. You know, my heart's still with that person for real. Um, you know, the, when you say stuff like, you know, better for worse to death you as part, it's true, you know. I don't, I think, again, like we were talking about lyrics, when you're young, you write stuff and you still believe some of it, you, it's still true, you know. But I know that it's not, it wasn't my life path and I had to move on. So I moved on and, and then, uh, you know, but then, then I got married again, but, you know, way later, I was not going to get married again after that heartbreak. I've like, <laughs> I done the marriage thing. What was next? But I'm married now. I, it's kind of cool. You know, I, I I got over myself. And, and so now I'm I'm happy, happily married with, with kids in school, man. But um, it's not the same thing. It, like It's like love and love, you know. It's mm -hmm. like there's so many definitions to it. And marriage can be so many things. But I think it was just, it was just a testament to to me thinking, trying, or being trusted to be a grown-up before I was a grown-up, you know. But I don't regret it because nothing bad happened. But uh, but it was good, man, because it made me it made me feel like I, ha I was on my way to something. So I've had a lot of lives. Only only got married twice, which I never thought I'd be married even once at the beginning. But mm. but, I'm, but but life life. Offers you opportunities to grow, you know, regardless. And uh, I definitely um, appreciate that. So, and everybody I come across has given me a lot. I was fortunate, very fortunate. Yeah. You're not get, you didn't get so, married yet? <laughs> not yet. I'm, I'm, I'm learning from all the men around me. I'm trying to take notes, <laughs> you know, what to look out take for, what to, 
you know, and and, and all you guys say the same thing. Take your time. Uh, yeah, I, man. I, I, I mean, because it's life, you know. Right. Marriage is a concept, you know. Love is different. Love is love, man. You get you love. Mm-hmm. You gotta love people. You gotta take care of your people, whoever they are, wherever you are. But if so you know, marriage can, is an can experiment. Can you break that down a little bit more? Uh, love being a concept. I mean, marriage being a concept. Marriage is a concept. Well, it's culture. It's a culture. You know, it's like it's a social contract. Um, mm-hmm. Love is a whole different story. Love has got so right. many definitions, man. I mean, depends on the context, but but uh, I was I, I've been driven by love, man. I've always been driven by love um, in all contexts. But but um, but yeah, marriage. It was a convention for me when I got married the first time. Actually, I was already in love and I was already in a relationship. And to me, I didn't need to prove to anybody that I love this person. So marriage was silly. I was like, I need to get married. But we were of their, like her family had religious, you know, beliefs that made it really hard for her to face her family while being with a man that she's not married to. So it's so when we actually got married. My feeling was that the pressure was coming from her having to be um, to honor her her father's faith, and that she couldn't be in a in a relationship if she wasn't married. So that kind of sped things up. So so definitely I have an opinion on on that. Not doing things because other people think you should be doing it. Because I did that. I got married too early. Honestly, I think it was too early. Um, because it put a pressure on our couple that that kind of might have been the cause of the stru- the, the the whole you know separation eventually because right. because suddenly we had we, we were people that love each other but also had to uh, you know represent something and you tell anybody like you're 18 years old and you're like this is my wife like oh you mean your girlfriend like no it's my wife people are like oh really and like it's a, it's like now you you represent it's something heavier. Yeah. Right. And I think that was a lot of pressure to be somebody's wife, to be Papillon's wife. At the time, I was, you know, I was doing stuff, so she was somebody's wife. Plus, we were in France most of the time, so um, my circle was her circle because she she uh, she met people through me a lot of the time. So it was too much pressure on her to not be herself. So then she had to break out and be herself. Um, But by then, you know, I I couldn't have that conversation. Don't worry. I agree with you. Let's not stress ourselves. And but but you know even while we were married, actually, some of my good friends now, some painters from from the the U.S., some graffiti artists. Well, they used to be graffiti artists. Now they're contemporary artists. You know, like we call graffiti writers anymore. But um, they're still we're still friends. And and back in the day, I remember like not allowing myself to hang out with them as much as I would naturally, because I'd introduce them to my wife, who was a painter. And I realized that she needed her people. And so I kind of sacrificed part of my circle to give her an opportunity to have her circle. So so she'd be with the artist, so she'd go out and paint and hang out with them. And I was like, damn, I was feeling kind of like, damn, I wish I was hanging out with my boys. But at the same time, I was like, nah, she needs her space. So it's hard, man. Being married is like a, it's people expect shit from you and, and it gets you trapped. So, so, so I tried to free her from some of it. I also did do stuff like trick myself into uh, my uh, my mind was thinking like, oh my wife is at home, let me go out. Like I just need to get out of the house. You know my wife is annoying. I'm like, what the fuck is that? That's some old man shit. And I was like a kid. Like <laughs> it's your woman. Is you love her? Why do you acting like? That? So so it, it messed it messed with my mind. It messed with my mind. I think being married too quick because we didn't even know what it meant, but we were doing it because we we're supposed to. Mm. So yeah, you got to be careful with that shit. Yeah, you can't just play a role that was written by by someone else or a culture that you haven't quite vetted yet. Absolutely. By now, I can understand. I could decide if I think it's a good thing or not. Whatever. I mean, my second marriage was similar. Is similar. I mean, initially, that there's there's stress with the family because we're not the same religion. Again, different religions. But still, I'm not even committed to one in particular, I wasn't actually, at least I wasn't saying anything about what my religion was. But um, again, when I met the mother of my kids, her, fa- her family was not, was not cool with me. 
Miss, they were cool with me because we got along, but they, ah, someone was bothering them. And we got married, but it still wasn't a real wedding because I wasn't convert, I convert, converted to their religion. So it's like, it's tough, man. That marriage is a is an institution, and institution means that there are rules, and they're not set by your heart or your soul. They're set by the culture that was built over generations of a certain faith or a certain customs and, and rituals. You know? Right. So you gotta know when you commit to something that you don't know about, not so good. You, you do your homework first before you make a so decision. So how, like how was it? How was the divorce process for you? I was. It was. I don't know. It was just administration. We were. We were separate. We were in different countries by then. We were separated. Um, and she was in England. I was in France. So, so she found a lawyer over there. I mean, just sending paperwork back and forth to get it done as cheap as possible. Because we didn't hate each other. We just right. had to move on. She had to move on. She just started a whole new life already before I knew it. You know. Um, but I think what was hardest about that divorce was that I had bought her a guitar and she never played it. And as soon as she she got with the next man, she started a rock band with him and started playing guitar. That what? I was like, fuck oh, man, I just I bought you that, you know? That was the hardest right. piece. It's like, damn it, because you know what it is? People see don't want to show the people that taught them that they learned from them. Mm. It's kind of weird pride thing. See, you feel me? I and that's you. how I felt it. She never wanted to, she was, she didn't want, she wanted people not to know who she used to be. So she had to come into a new world and be this new person that already had all these things. But because I'd seen her, like I said earlier, we became adults together. So I knew a lot of that process and I knew her youthful, her, and I knew her feminine, I knew her, 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 her grown up version. So I felt like I had a lot of the data and I think there's something right. to that when you're young, you don't want people to know, like, I want to come yeah. out and like, you know, no, no, nothing about me. I'm not like mm -hmm. that. I can't be like that. Like, see, like we've been talking and I've been, I tell you what are you asking me about? I'll tell you the whole story because as I believe right now is a time of reckoning. We're in a true, at a particular stage in history, in, in human history. We have no time to make shit up. It's, it's over. You gotta mm -hmm. tell the truth, work out what's real, what's not real, because there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of shit to, we gotta be doing now. And if we waste time trying to like pretend, we're not gonna finish the job before it's too late. So we need, we got a lot of issues coming up. My humanity is going through a lot right now. And so my piece of the cake is make sure the ingredients are you know, on the label. Everything you wanna know, I'm gonna tell you because I need to build from now on. And if I give you false information or half of the information, we're, build, we're not building on a strong foundation. So, so that's where we're at now. So you gotta, you gotta really, um, I think it's time to speak the truth. And um, that's why, you know, my people now that know me, they know I got beef with nobody. Everybody know, like, if I have brought something I don't like about something, I'm gonna say it. And so we're free from, from from fake shit and we're free from from having to imagine what do you mean when you say that people ask you what are you trying to say like i'm not trying to say i just said it i don't try to say shit i say shit right i don't mean anything that's not been said except in my songs i might there'll be the meaning that you heard and it, i mean it plus it might be a second and third meaning because it's wordplay so i'll be like you know you, you do poetry and there's multiple layers to that so in that sense I, I there's some extra um knowledge and extra data in in my words but there's never like a contradiction there's not never a lie there's never nothing i'm hiding if anything if you find anything behind my words it's more you know it's the okay. second meaning you know but it's it's not contradictory and it's not i may not make it shit up because and I know I'm too lazy. My memory's shot. I can't remember what, if I lied to you, I wouldn't remember what I told you, so I wouldn't know how to stick to the lie. <laughs> I have to tell the truth, man. And my memory is so simple. I, if I tell the truth, I'd never forget it. All right. Thank you for that. Big, big gym for all the young people out there. Uh, you, you, you letting us know what's the real, because 
a lot of times we fall into these social contracts because there's no one around us to really have these conversations with and educate us on their experience. So we just end um, up doing it on the trial and error. I mean, this that's, that's a thing. Trial and error is important. It works on some stuff, but you don't have to do it. You don't have time to do it with everything. Exactly. You got to trust. You got to be able to live, you know, uh, use other people's experience. And unfortunately, that's not how our brains work. But you know what? We ain't got time to try everything and mess up once. So, so, so we got to we got to listen to other people's story. And especially when we're sharing a story, we got to tell the truth so that the person, once they've heard it, they know it and they can count on it and then they can use it. If I fake my shit, if any of my story is fake, you say, see, well, he did it that way. And then they're going to try because I, I, I faked the success story and, and, and they'll fail or I faked a failure and they'll think, oh, I won't try that when they should be trying it. So it's, it's really important at this point in my life. We, we need to do shit together. We need to, to not make shit up. Uh, the only uh, stuff we got to invent is dreams, is like suggestions for p potential futures. Like, let's try this, let's try that. You know, I don't know. Like, but not make shit up that we know isn't true. Got to make shit up that we think might become true. We can, we can do that. We should do that. So I got, I got two more questions before we wrap up. <clears throat> Uh, one, I want to ask, um, how was fatherhood for you, and how was father? How did fatherhood affect um, your artistry and the time that you were able to dedicate to it? And I guess how did children affect your marriage as well? Uh, well, children change everything. <laughs> my children, you know, it feels like my children came before they were born. Wow. Let me let me tell you what I mean. Um I had relationships before my uh relationship with their mother. And um and at times, you know, in a relationship you tend to try to imagine what if we did this together and had children and there's a family or whatever. And a couple occasions I was with the wrong person and I wouldn't know how to tell you where it came from, well, at the time. But there's a this kind of a, a spirit that would speak to me and tell me this one I remember one particularly wonderful woman and I it could have been a great life, but a wonderful woman who wanted to be my wife and have my babies and I was like I can't do it. And uh and she has to ask me why, so I have to explain. So that was painful. <laughs> but I was like, I had to tell her something that I, was true, but it might make me sound crazy at the time. I, I had, it's like a, a spirit told me that that wasn't, it's like, that's not my mom. That's not my mother. I can't mm. come to be. So I put an end to that relationship. Maybe something else triggered it too but I, all I know is that I, I really to this day remember that feeling that my children told me when it was not the right person not not to go down the path it wasn't a, a god it wasn't an angel it wasn't nothing it was clearly my descendant that was like in order for me to arrive and actually be part of this life experience you need not, it's not through this woman and your union. And when I met their mom, you know, it was yet another person you meet in life. But by the time, I, I, one day, before we even started flirting and becoming a couple, I, I, I met this woman and I was feeling her. I was like, this is, this is the, the mother of my kids. Mm. And, uh, and that drove me to pursue a friendship with her. Eventually, we started a relationship, a romantic relationship. But the day I re realized that, um, actually, I visited her in the south of France. I was doing a tour. We were we had released a record. Me and my boy we, we were dropping off the vinyls all in, in all these record stores that were all around the country. And so I'm like, Yo, I know this girl in Marseille, man. We got to go there and check them out. Plus, there's a couple of record stores. We got some connects. So we do that, and then I go see her. And, uh, and she dropped me off at the train station. And I wrote a song about it. It's on my album. 
calligraphy um, called Want to Stay. The song is called Want to Stay. And it's about that moment where I was leaving the train state. Oh, my train's leaving and she's on the platform. But but I, I, I was writing it on the train. I was looking out the window and, and it's that I knew that I was going to be connected to this woman for the rest of my life. And, and and that voice was the voice of the kid, you know. And so then my kids come up in my life one after the other. You know, first I had a kid. We were in Paris and it was kind of surprising. We had this baby. I had just released my album, my first solo album. That's how I met her, actually, because I was promoting. I was, I was preparing the promo, promo for my album and she was organizing events. So um, I'm like, yeah, I got this album coming out and stuff soon next year. And by the time the album comes out, and I, uh, uh, we we uh, we had a baby. It was funny, but but um, because you know how albums take a minute. It just tells me this album took a minute to come out because we didn't date for a minute. But but on the album cover, my first album is called The Amber Dawn. On the back of the album, on the cover art, there's the um, echography. The um, how do you say uh, the uh, uh, the image of you know when you when uh when a woman's pregnant they do the imagery echography mm-hmm. I forget what you call it in English and uh, you and you see the baby the what ultrasounds ultrasound thank you so we do the ultrasound we get a picture of 2D and it's not it's like really cheap man I could see the profile of the kid and I put him in the artwork because the back of my album was it's wood mm-hmm. grain and I worked it into the wood grain so people that wouldn't know, wouldn't know it's there, but it looks like a water stain on the wood grain. This is actually a profile of my first baby. Mm. And all that to say that he was born, I released the album, he's born, I'm on tour to promote the album, and I'm on stage. I had a live band, so I was doing this hip-hop act, but with a whole live band. And I get to the mic at one point in the concert, I didn't feel right, because he was just born, eight days after he was born, I was on stage doing this show. And, and I told the audience, because I was feeling weird, you know? So, you know, in between songs, we talk, you know, we're artists, we talk to the audience, and some of us have a uh, tendency. So I was like, well, I, got, I gotta tell them something. And I told the audience, this big festival, that I just had a baby. And that always has us, you know, yeah, yo, and everybody's all excited for you. So I was cool, that's a good right. way to hype it up. So my band's like, yeah, man, good move. Like it's, you know. <laughs> And I'm like, but then I carry on and I tell them, you know, I love all y'all, but I'd rather be home right now. I miss my mm. baby. I just had my first baby. and I don't want to be touring the country and being away from my family. And uh, everybody gets all emotional. And then we start the song. And like, <laughs> so, so it kind of worked, I guess, for that night. But after the show, my band members was like, the fuck, man? What are you talking about? Telling people you're not gonna, you're not gonna tour, you know, and it was true. I, I ended the tour. I said, "Fuck it, I can't do this." I was so painful, man. And my child, so so it stopped me in my career to have a baby. In that sense, but this stopped my artistic evolution. I, I'm, I actually made better music since he's been born. Then I had another baby. I lost, we lost the baby, and then we had another boy that came up. So we have two boys now. And my wife has a, a, a big boy. He's 33 years old already. I got a big man because when I met her, she had a boy already. So I raised him with her. I got my grandfather, son. I'm like, I got grandkids and shit. Wow. So um, <laughs> these these people, like my kids and the grandkids, and my nieces and nephews, they make me happy, man. And and, and they make and uh, they take a lot of time. So I'm not as prolific, but right. the music I make. Is um, I'm enjoying it. I'm happy. It's like, and also I got it made me have to enjoy music in my soul, in my heart, in my head. I make I got people say, oh, so so too bad you're not making music anymore. And now I'm back in it. But for a minute I wasn't making any music. Both being like, man, you stop music and shit. I'm like, nah, it's just y'all can't hear it. It's still, I'm still making music every day in my head. I got albums, man. I got lyrics, I got harmony. And so it gave me a new perspective on what it meant to make art, to be an artist. 
and uh, and that and so when I release something now, I release. I want it to be perfect because I don't want to. I don't want to half-ass it. Back in the if I before I had kids, I just release a bunch of new featurings on all people's records. It didn't matter, you know. Just do sixteen bars on somebody's thing, whatever, and it's not mastered properly, whatever. But now I'm like, no, nah, first finishing it got to be tight because I'm not taking time away from my my loved ones to just do nonsense. So so now actually it gave me a lot of power and. It gives me perspective because they play me music. I hear what they want to listen to. I have to honor honor it because I got to listen to what they like, you know, because nothing hurts more than when people tell you that your music sucks. That what you listen to, you know, because even if, I mean, I know some of this shit they listen to is terrible. Some of the stuff I listened to when I was a kid is terrible. But I can't tell them that all the time. Right. But they heard me say, I don't like this or, you know, but I'll sing to anything. I love, I love music. So now a lot of what happens with music because I had to take a step back as, as a performer and as a music producer and, and, and recording artist, it made me really enjoy when someone other than myself makes a record I like. Like I heard some stuff a few years ago, I was like, man, they can do that. I'm so happy, because our shit was eclectic. My music was kind of always kind of off the chain, like a whole other category. I wasn't sticking to the trends, because I was like, well, we could try something else, because that's already been done. And now I'll hear people, Recently, it's like I was into Earth Gang a couple years ago, or stuff like that. Now it goes, it changes beats, the rhythm changes up, music stops, something else happens. But now they'll play stuff and they'll cut the sound in the middle and bring it back and whatever. Everybody's doing that now, and it's authorized. And I'm like, yes, I'm like that's what we were doing. We were breaking the rules. There were serious rules when I was younger. We were trying, like I told you, with a virgin in them. There's serious rules. It's got to be a three-minute song. The hook's got to come in by the first minute. The intro can't be more than 20 seconds. It's got to, you know, there's all these rules for airplay, for radio stuff. I'm like, now I'm hearing stuff. I'm hearing artists that are instrument. That the lead, the lead is an instrument. That was that we couldn't do that. We couldn't have like. And on my records, you'll hear it. There'll be like, you know, first like it'll be a verse, and then there'll be like 16 bars of a saxophone solo. And I'm like, yeah, because because I, I, I want that space. That's where this is supposed to happen in my ears, you know? But um, record companies and radios like, yo, man, you don't play instrumental stuff. You don't do this. Oh, what is that? Is it rap? Is it reggae? Is it jazz? We don't get it, right? But now you can do anything. And so I'll have to say that the fact that I've not been in the fight trying to get airplay or trying to get famous or trying to be in, in in the spotlight means that I can sit back and watch other people that have that opportunity or that platform do stuff that we we worked so hard to be allowed to do and now that people are allowed to do it. I feel like we we set the foundation for some real shit. So I'm 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 happy I I, I stepped back honestly and and, and yes you know, to the angle of, of, of being a parent that's is indeed the thing that made me have to slow down because no i didn't have to but i didn't want to be on the road all the time away from my kids it just wasn't an option but i chose to do that and then life gave it back to me and thanked me for it by by showing me beautiful art made by others and stuff that like i hear the, I listen to the songs i think i wrote them I'm like oh yeah hear what we did this week it's not my song I heard some of your stuff. I was like, mm -hmm. felt mm -hmm. like I was in the studio when you did. You know, well, I wasn't, but I felt when I heard it, I was like, that's us. And I became part of the soul, the creative soul of, of man. I'm like, we are music. And now my kids are grown. Well, my youngest one is about to be 12. And, and then I've got a 16 year old at home, but they're already, I mean, I know within a blink of an eye, they'll be out of my life doing whatever they want to do. And and I'm getting ready now to get back in music. I'm having a good time now making music. So so I stepped back. I didn't do. I didn't stop making music. I can't say that. But I stopped trying to promote myself. So um, for example, when I moved, I moved to the states and then to Dominica. I was producing other artists. So I was making music for others because I, I want. I removed my ego from it. I was like, when I can serve someone else to make their record, I feel good and I feel free from judgment. Because I'm just listening to, to the artist and trying to get out whatever I think is going to help them get their message across. And so that is my position now. And I think being a parent is part of that. It's instead of like trying to be the one to, 
has all the experiences, you set the stage for your kids to have an, a beautiful life experience. And they don't even know you're doing it. And then they complain when they don't have shit. But it's because you always hooked it up so they had everything they needed to even realize you've done the work. Yep. So that's what happened. And, and music now that I make has gained from that because I've learned to use what I have instead of using it for me and showing everybody how cool and smart and fresh I am. I used it to, to say, yo, let's make him look cool and fresh and like make him happy. And, uh, and so I got to thank my kids, man, all day. Yeah. They did not slow me down. So the very, very last question, um, I always ask all my visitors that come on, um, death is a universal experience. We're all on this earth for a set amount of time. And we all strive to make that the best time as we can. So when Papillon leaves this earth, how does he want to be remembered? And what does he want to be remembered for? Oh, man, you know what? Every day will be a different answer. But, but right now you're asking me that. Truth is, um, I want y'all to remember... All I wanted you to know is that you're yeah, all right, and, and I'll make sure you, you have the feeling like you're all right when you're around me. That anytime you was around me, you got a glass of water, and you got a massage, you got the right music in your ears. I showed you the view. I just get to, so that's kind of you know, I just want to make sure people remember that that we I I want I want to be in that that kind of direction. Oh yeah, remember Papillon? Yeah, man. Yeah, he's all right. I, I felt good. I, yeah, you know, I just chilling. I, it's not about any of because you asked me about from my personal history this time. Usually, I, I, I don't. I mean, I share, like I said, anything you want to know. But truth is, what matters to me is how you doing, man. And my favorite word, one of my favorite expressions, is "see you tomorrow." Yeah, so that's kind of what I hope people just. Come and, and celebrate, and then move on and, and see each other tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the Papillon interview. I'm Khalil Gibran, one time for your mind, two time for your spine. Expect some really dope music coming from me and Papillon. It's coming very, very, very soon. So this interview was a, a precursor to that. So um, stay on the lookout. And Papillon, let them know where to find you. Yeah, man, you can. Uh, I, I'm doing my thing um, uh, on Instagram. You can find Papillon the Peanut Butterfly on Instagram. Most of what I'm posting these days is my interactions with nature, um, trying to uh, grow some trees and and help people connect again to nature. And my music. Um, you can find my music on Bandcamp. So that'll be papillon.bandcamp.com or on the Spotify. Although I think. I'm not sure Spotify's redirecting the cash my way when y'all listen on it, but <laughs> Bandcamp does. Um, and I got a website. It's at butterside.com, so you can check that out. And uh, you'll find me. I'm in the stars, you know. Here we go. Yeah, man. Well, we thank you. We thank you again. Thank you, my brother. Hope to have you back very soon. Yes, sir. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you soon, my brother. Yep. Take it easy, bro. One love.